uh, and he employs you know 10,000 of the city's 50,000 people. Uh, and so he has a huge say in how the city functions simply because if he gives everybody a raise or a pay cut, the city might you know grow or it might blow up, uh, right? And uh, that's nothing that people really ever thought would be a thing that would happen. Uh, no one had imagined that companies could be so big, right? Uh, so to give you uh, a good example, there's a, there's a way to tell the story uh, using particular people. Right? It's a very American way to do it. Uh, the, there's a writer named uh, Malcolm Gladwell who writes these sort of quirky columns for the New York Times and he writes books and stuff. He tried to come up with at some point a list of the richest people in the history of the world. And it's a really subjective list because how rich, for example, was Julius Caesar? Uh, and the answer is I have no idea because like well, how rich was he, right? Even a guy like Tiberius, who was said to be worth uh, 20 million uh, solidi. Uh, well, I mean, what's a solidi? What's a solidus worth today? It's a gold Roman gold coin, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Gladwell, he's bending his methodology a bit and you know, going through some explanations. He tries to come up with a list of what he thinks is relevant to their, to their sort of time and place, but also in some ways absolute ever, the richest people in the history of the world. And the top 10, of the top 10, like five or six of them are guys who got rich during this exact period, during the period right during and after the American Civil War. They all born at about the same time, which means they all came into their lives about their mid-20s at about the exact same time. That's just when they're finished being kids and just before they get settled into an adult job, right? Because once you hit your sort of adult job, you're reluctant to maybe go off and make big changes in your life. And he points out that that's not an accident, right? Uh, the fact is there was this moment in America where everything changed, everything was kind of up for grabs, and a number of people came in and got a big chunk of it, right? A number of people came in and grabbed a big piece of the pie before it all got divvied up by other people, and they became, as a result, fantastically, almost ludicrously, insanely wealthy as a result. Uh, and so the, the term that was often used to describe these guys in the 19th century and after was robber barons. Uh, the emphasis is on the fact that these guys got their money sort of illegitimately. They were sort of vaguely, like morally, ethically, legally questionable, right? There was there was this sense that these guys sort of somehow gained the system to gain an enormous amount of power. The, the robber barons itself is a term that goes back to Eng uh, to Europe in the 1400s, where bear, uh, knights, uh, noblemen, would build castles along rivers and they would block the river and extract tolls from people going up and down the river, right? Like I have a castle and I have a bunch of guys with bows and arrows and if you try to sail your ship down the river, I'll burn your ship unless you give me money, right? Uh, and then I don't really do anything productive except extract money from people, right? But I get rich doing it. Uh, and so uh, these guys were viewed as a, as a sort of a nuisance. And the idea was that these guys had somehow in America done the same thing. They'd come up with ways to sort of extract money from the system, uh, enormous amounts of money. And so, uh, and again, a wonderfully American way you can sort of tell the story by looking at a, a number of people, right? This is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, and Vanderbilt got started in uh, steamboats, actually, of all things. Uh, he got involved in a business in the early 1800s running steamboats between uh, the various boroughs of Manhattan, New York City, uh, the outer boroughs, and New Jersey. This was before uh, New York City uh, incorporated the outer boroughs. There was a time when Brooklyn uh, was, for example, literally a separate city. A corporation happened in 1898, actually. Uh, and so well into the 19th century, if you went to Manhattan, uh, southern Manhattan, the southern tip was all buildings, and about halfway up the island, it was literally forest. Like, you just, the city just kind of stopped. And every year, they would knock up some trees down and build a new skyscraper, right? Uh, did you have a question? Uh, and so uh, there was a lot of money to be made moving goods and people very rapidly between these areas, the, the, the Long Island, Staten Island, Manhattan, Brooklyn, northern New Jersey. And so uh, what's happened is that a Vanderbilt and a buddy of his named Ogden got in the steamboat business. Now, the, the steamboat business had a very low profit margin and, and had a very, very competitive business nature. You typically made your money uh, by not so much uh, charging people for tickets and collecting a profit, but by you made so little money, you also had to make sure that you had no competitors, right? You can't have anybody stealing your customers. So often what they would do was they would get a bunch of money, they would fund their steamboat operations for a while, and they would cut the prices of their tickets so low they would make no money, but it would be less than the other guy, right? So it's like, I'll, I'll take you for 50 cents. He'll take you for a dollar and he'll make 25 cents. I'm gonna make negative 25 cents, but of course you're gonna go on my steamboat because it's cheaper. And then after two, three weeks, he goes out of business and I raise my prices again, right? Uh, and so anything to get people there faster, they would, they would, uh, they would push the steam engines of the boats as fast as they could uh, and say, I can get you to New York City in 20 minutes, not 25, uh, right? I'll serve you a steak and give you a beer and there'll be a bar on my boat too, which is more fun anyway, right? Uh, and every once in a while the steam engines would blow up and everybody would die, but it's like literally only like a one in 12 chance. So it's probably, it's probably fine, right? It's probably fine. <laughs> 
And so uh, this was the, the steamboat business, right? It's very cutthroat. Uh, what happened is they extended their line to New Jersey. They got in a legal dispute with a guy named Gibbons who alleged that he had a monopoly for the state of New Jersey, granting him monopoly control over the steamboats in and around New Jersey. And in the early 19th century, a lot of states in order to build things would issue these kind of monopolies, right? They would give someone a right to build like a bridge over a river. And understandably, we really need a bridge over the river, right? It's gonna make everything better for everybody. But of course, the construction company says, look, we're not gonna build a nice bridge that's gonna cost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then some guy's gonna throw like a two by four across two rocks and take our business away, right? We have to charge a toll to get the business paid for, the bridge paid for. That guy's gonna charge people nothing. Uh, so what the state legislature would do is they say, look, if you build a bridge, you can charge tolls to pay for the bridge, and nobody else can build a bridge until you've paid for the bridge, right? until you've, you've run out the tolls, right? Uh, and so they would give people a monopoly, right? And this is what the guy uh, uh, gave its hat, right? So he sued uh, Vanderbilt, uh, and in fact, uh, Vanderbilt and his partner won in the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Marshall argued that, uh, that the states didn't have the ability to grant monopolies of that kind. Uh, he threw that out. Uh, and so it was a big deal because on the one hand, this was a major way that states got things built in the early 19th century. On the other hand, uh, it was decided that, that was against the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Uh, Vanderbilt was already on the way out. He was already done with that. Uh, and he was already moving on to railroads, which is the next big thing, as it turns out. Uh, and Vanderbilt made a lot of money in railroads. He didn't really build railroads. He bought railroads and he merged railroads uh, and he manipulated railroads. It turns out railroads are a very funny business. They're a lot like the telephone. Uh, or something like that, where the more of it you have, the more valuable all of it becomes, right? And so if you're the only person with a telephone, it's useless. Uh, on the other hand, if two people have a telephone, then at least they can call each other. And every person that gets added to the telephone network makes all other telephones better because now every telephone can call one other person. Uh, and when everyone has a telephone, now telephones are great. The railroad works the same way. Every mile of railroad track that you build makes all the other railroad track better because it's a, now you can go from A to B to C and to D or anywhere in between. Uh, and so uh, Vanderbilt discovered this, figured this out, and started buying up railroads as fast as he could. Uh, the thing he did, though, was actually really kind of engage in corruption. Uh, his favorite thing to do was engage in the thing they call watering the stock. He would buy a railroad, uh, overestimate its value, sell shares of stock in the company, and then the company would go bankrupt, and he would just kind of shrug and say, oh, well, you knew the risks when you bought the share. What can you do? And walk away with the money, right? And then you would look at the railroad and say, well, it really only owns a quarter of a mile of rusty track in central New Jersey and one locomotive, which means it's worth nothing. And Vanderbilt would say, well, I mean, I, you know, oh, well, this has happened, right? Uh, the watering the stock actually comes from cattle. When you sell cows to, uh, uh, like, for the meat, you sell them by weight. Uh, and so if you're particularly scrupulous, what you do is you take Bessie the cow and you jam a hose down Bessie's throat and you pump about 80 gallons of water into Bessie's four stomachs, which is fine, so Bessie will be fine, uh, right? And then when you weigh Bessie, Bessie weighs like a lot and the guy's like, wow, I want this cow, there's a lot of meat on this cow. And you're like, oh yeah. And so you get paid for Bessie, you leave town, and then the guy walks Bessie over to the corral and she vomits 80 gallons of water. <laughs> uh, and again, Bessie's fine, the cow's gonna do this, is fine. Uh, but all of a sudden you look at Bessie and you're like, there's not as much Bessie as I paid for, right? Like I paid for a couple hundred more pounds of Bessie than I got. Uh, that's literally watering the stock, right? Literally inflating the value of a cow. Uh, so that's what Vanderbilt would do, right? And so it's, it's hard to argue that he didn't really build railroads against so much as he manipulated them. He got involved in the mergers and acquisitions of railroads. We care about all this because, of course, we'll talk about the railroad in a minute. It's a huge deal. But Vanderbilt's fascinating because at the end of his life, when he died, he had a bunch of kids. Uh, I want to say he had six kids. And when he died, he, he in his will, he left uh, five of his kids a very large cash payment, like a million dollars. And the sixth kid, his oldest kid, got the entire Vanderbilt business. Uh, and the reason Vanderbilt did this is not that he hated five of his kids and loved one kid, is that one kid got the business and the other kids got a cash payout because they didn't want to run a business, uh, right? It, it makes perfect sense. He didn't want to break his business up and divide it up amongst his kids. But as you might imagine, when the uh, five kids who got cash realized that they had gotten much less than their older sibling, they took the older sibling to court. And the reason this matters is it's through the 1870s, uh, and Vanderbilt's kids go to court, and a, a, a fight in court among rich people over money is like, we all want to watch this happen, right? We're, the tabloids were all over it. It's all public, because it's happening in a court. You can read the court documents, right? Uh, and it comes out that the total value of Vanderbilt's estate, it's like in 1871, is $100 million. Ooh. Vanderbilt's worth $100 million when he died, and he gave 
five kids, yeah, you give five kids a million dollars and you give one kid $95 million. And so it's impossible to overstate the value of this estate today. If Bill Gates has said he's going to give away 95% of his money before he dies anyway, and uh, Jeff Bezos, I think, is worth $11 billion. Jeff Bezos in 2018 is not as rich as Vanderbilt was in 1871. $100 million today would be like a trillion dollars. Uh, or $100 million in 1871 would be like a trillion dollars today. Was, uh, things did not cost as much, inflation had not happened as much. Uh, and so it was, it was an almost, people were um, fascinated by this whole story, right? And they, I mean, rich people fighting over money is always tabular fodder, but people just couldn't believe that people would, a uh, single person would be worth $100 million. It's an almost indescribable sum of money. It's like a, you know, a quadrillion is a real number. It's like the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy, but it's not like nobody's ever gonna have that much money. You just, you just, you it defies sort of description. Uh, that someone would be that wealthy. And this was the first clue that, that things had changed. That nobody had ever in American history ever gotten that wealthy before. It wasn't really possible to. You simply couldn't make money fast enough over the course of your life to become this wealthy. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, the Vanderbilt actually had done that, uh, right? Uh, and so the other guy that we can mention uh, to give you another uh, story here is this guy, Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie is born in Scotland. Uh, he was born in Northern Scotland, actually. Uh, in a little town near where the Queen of England today has a, a castle where she raises corgis, actually. Uh, and so Carnegie came from a town where weaving and weaving wool had been the primary occupation for generations. Uh, they, for a long, long time, the only thing of value the English produced was high-quality wool. It was the only commodity they produced. Uh, England has an awful climate, limited agriculture, no natural resources, but it made wool. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the Dutch used to buy the wool and resell it to Europe to make, you know, cloaks and hats and and blankets and stuff. Uh, and so uh, the wool woven in uh, Scotland was woven by hand. It was very, very thick and very high quality. What happened is mechanical weaving came in, right? Weaving machines came in and would come in and weave the wool automatically. You still needed to be skilled to operate the machines, but they could produce wool 10 times as fast as a hand weaver, which meant they could produce it 10 times as cheap, uh, right? And so a small percentage of weavers ended up getting jobs in the weaving mills, the textile mills. The cloth was obviously not as good but I mean, it's way cheaper, so more people could buy it, right? And so instead of selling very good wool to upper class people, now you're gonna sell pretty good wool to like everybody, right? And what happened is the town was plunged into poverty. Something like 90% of the adult male workforce lost their jobs, and the town never really recovered. Uh, Carnegie's father drifted from like part-time job to part-time job to part-time job. Uh, he never quite really ever figured it out. Uh, the mother kept the family together, and finally she was of the opinion that they were just they were done. They, they just had to get out of here. She correctly pointed out that her husband, Carnegie, saw was never going to get a real job, certainly not in the wool industry. That's dead, right? Uh, and so she moved the family to the United States of America. They moved to Pennsylvania. Uh, Carnegie was a very young man. He got a job making uh, hat pins in a, a bobbin pin factory for a while. Like, that was okay. His favorite job was as a uh, telegraph message deliverer, telegraph message boy. So you would, a telegraph would come into the local telegraph office addressed to you, and they would take the message and translate it from Morse code, and, and then they would put it in an envelope, and they would give it to a kid who would go run off to, you know, they have a map of the city, and they would show him where it is, and he'd go run off and find you, and you'd pay for the telegram, right? You'd pay him for the message and, and a tip, presumably, and then uh, maybe if, if, you know, he would take a reply, right? Uh, and so uh, Carnegie loved that. He loved running around outside, talking to various groups of people. He loved uh, to sort of seeing all the sort of different businesses that were happening, all the, the business that was booming in the city. Uh, and uh, they were in Pittsburgh, I think. And uh, his, one day he actually got a, a small business tip uh, and he invested some of his money and he made $100. Uh, and he thought, I've never been so proud of any money I've ever had in my life. But the businessman he delivered a message to said, you know, if you, if you have any cash, you should buy you should buy this particular kind of item because the price is going to skyrocket. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to go buy it. That's what the message is about. And uh, when Carnegie told his mother, she took the money and used it to pay the rent. Uh, and he was so angry. He was, a year, decades later, he wrote his memoirs. He was still mad about it. Uh, he said, I get it. We were poor. The money was necessary. But I mean, I made that money. And so uh, Carnegie did a variety of things, but he got into the steel making business, uh, which was, as you might imagine, a big thing in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of iron and coal in Pennsylvania, both of which you need for steel, iron to turn into steel, coal to smelt the steel. The problem with steel is that it is an incredibly useful material, but it's expensive. Uh, steel is, is a good replacement for iron. Uh, the thing about steel is that it is stronger, it's tougher, and it's lighter than iron. Uh, anything you could make out of iron would be better if you made it out of steel. The problem is steel is expensive. It's so expensive that it's often not worth making things 
out of it. 